Video games have a problem with sexualizing the female characters as a take as original as saying that sweaters are nice and the sky has clouds. We've all heard it before, and we've all seen the examples. Ivy from Soul Calibur, Morgan from Darkstalkers, Rachel from Ninja Gaiden, and... everyone from Dead or Alive. Ugh, God, let's just skip over that one. So when you read the description of Bayonetta and its sequel, you may think it's yet another example of this. A witch with long legs who uses BDSM moves as special attacks, uses weapons like stripper poles, is constantly framed in very sexual shots, and the not-so-insignificant detail that all her boss fights end in her removing her clothes to eat monsters with her hair. Hey, I never said this was a grounded game. So you may expect this to just be another game that puts its female character in a revealing outfit and treats her as a product for the male gaze. And you're not entirely wrong. Bayonetta is not subverting the gratuitous nature of many games and their habit of exploiting the female figure. It instead goes so balls to the wall with it that it's completely shameless instead. It's not coy about it. It's not implied. It's right there in your face to the point of violating social distance mandates. More so than any other game I've seen. So, what is it about Bayonetta that people love so much? What is it about her that makes gamers, women, and queer people like myself either love or hate her? Well, let's dive in and find out. Before diving in, let's get into the story. I'm mainly going to be discussing the basics to keep this video from being an hour long. Bayonetta, also known as Cereza, is an Umbran witch, who are known as the Dwellers of Darkness. Her mission is to defeat the Lumen Sages after war is enacted by the clan. Among Bayonetta, you have Jean, her fellow Umbran witch, who has been her sister since birth and the only other surviving member of their clan, Rodan, the devilish merchant who provides Bayo with her weaponry and techniques throughout the story, and the Lumen Sage, the main antagonist of the franchise who is depicted as Bayonetta's fighting equal. The story is rather complicated and convoluted, but the focus is put on Bayonetta and her journey as she discovers the truth about herself and fights to save the witches and restore the balance lost when the war began. Above all else, she is the star of the show. Fitting as this is a series named after her. There are times where other characters are displayed, but the story and its actions are pushed by Bayonetta and her decisions. There is never a moment where Bayonetta isn't in control of the situation or the scenario. She's the protagonist of the story, and the protagonist of her life. But who's behind this particular protagonist? The devs of Bayonetta are the masters of the hack and slash genre, Platinum Games, developers of the games Metal Gear Rising, Nier Automata, Vanquish, and Astral Chain, and the director is Hideki Kamiya of Devil May Cry, Okami, and Resident Evil 2 fame. For the most part, the team is composed of men, but then come some sticking points, mainly character designer. Bayonetta herself was designed by Mari Shimazaki, known for her work on Okami, Soul Calibur, Tekken, among other things. She was the designer behind all of Bayonetta's characters, including the titular MC. On the Platinum Games blog, Mari talked about her experience in designing Bayo. From the initial three points given of female lead, modern witch, and using four guns, what followed was a year-long process of sketching, tweaking, and finalizing the design. What she came up with was a beehive donning, movement accentuated, eight-foot-tall, long-armed, long-legged, gun for stiletto-wearing witch. Oh, and at the request of the lead designer, glasses which according to Mari was supposed to show Bayo's intelligence and mystery while making her stand out, but she says it was most likely because Kamiya-san likes girls with glasses, to the point of putting the production on hold because the higher-ups didn't like the glasses. If you want to see more about that, check out the Eyes of Bayonetta documentary in the description below. Furthermore, in the game's sequel, Mari talks about how she went about the character's redesign, going with a shorter, more masculine hairstyle and striking color scheme. With there being so much of the outfit in front, they decided to open up the back, though with a touch of making the glasses softer. All of this in an effort to make a strong and memorable female character for the franchise. The team knew they wanted a female character to counter the abundance of male protagonists, especially in the action game world. So for that, they wanted the right designer, which led them to Mari. She's a big part for why Bayonetta looks the way she does and her outfit is what it is. Given how women drawn by men tend to look like, um, well this, Mari's vision for Bayo shines through. It's hard to imagine the final product without Mari, or even without a woman designing the character herself. Hideki Kamiya himself has talked about how Bayo is his ideal woman, and has definitely said rather problematic things about women and his ideas behind Bayonetta. 
Camille may have these old-fashioned and misogynistic ideas when it comes to how women look and how women act, but that is tempered by having women in the team in such vital roles. His thinking is not filled with nuance. So Marin provides that nuance with her input, her design of the character, and taking these ideas and making them unique, even adding her own details like the open back of the outfit in both iterations. And what they ended up with was a character that is sleek, highly feminine in presentation, and shrouded in strong mystical energy. This further extends into the mocap actor of Bayonetta, Maiko Uchida, who provided the character with her sleek moves and striking poses, and her amazing ending dance sequence. And you can't talk about Bayonetta without mentioning her English VA, Helena Taylor. I feel like a fucking celebrity in this town. Every line is delivered with a strong, Broadway-like energy and cadence that adds to the character of Bayonetta. While the team itself is largely men, the women of the project make their presence known and went towards making a memorable main character for the franchise. So, what is it about Bayonetta? Why do characters like these get written off as fan service and forgotten about, while the conversation around her continues? Well, let's talk about that. It's clear that Bayonetta is... <clears throat> sexualized, to say the least. And depending on who you ask, this is either another example of a sexualized female character in video games, or an example of a strong character who owns her sexuality and her life. As far as I can tell, the intention of the creators was solely on making a strong, striking, stylish, and sleek female protagonist for their series. They wanted to make many aspects of the game feminine. To the roses when taking damage, to the lighter and brighter music of the games, to the kiss mark marking your targets, blowing kisses to progress, and the NICE LEGS DAISY DUKES MAKES A MAN GO DREADFUL Even Bayonetta's name was simply the word bayonet with an A added to make it sound like a woman's name. There's a lot of stereotypically feminine things being juxtaposed against scenes of violence more commonly seen as being masculine. Much of Bayonetta's disposition and actions have a stereotypically feminine energy. What is that exactly? Well, I provided a link to an article down below, but it seems what constitutes such things are things like embracing your sexuality, being proud of being a woman, speaking your mind freely, and creatively expressing yourself. I think we can all agree that Bayo is certainly not shying away from any of this. If anything, she was made to be the ultimate in stereotypical feminine expression. Now, is that a good thing? Well, I believe she represents a juxtaposition to the typical action hero protagonist. That being the big, muscular man who kicks so much ass that he's been given a restraining order by donkey ranches. Even amongst other female characters, Bayonetta is a standout. Some of my favorite female characters in games among Bayo are ones like Clementine from The Walking Dead, Aloy from Horizon Zero Dawn, Tubi from The Automata, and Laura Croft. Even among these women, Bayonetta stands out from them. She's an example of a character that completely uses her femininity in every aspect, even down to her main weapons being literal gun heels. Now, that doesn't discount the characters I mentioned previously. Hell, the more diversity we have with not only having more female MCs, but a variety in their personalities and backgrounds can only be a good thing. And from the sound of it, this is a big part of why Bayonetta is the beloved and maligned figure that she is. Not only her sexual nature, but her overtly feminine one too. Ever since the first game in 2009, Bayonetta has been a character with hot debate around her. You have the side saying she's an exemplar of female characters in the video game sphere, and you have the side that says she's another example of an overly sexualized female character who is constantly being treated like a piece of meat on display. But what stuck out to me with Bayonetta is how many people who identify as women, trans, queer, and so on love her, and how the often considered main gamer base of straight men are not as infatuated. I provided a link to a panel about that very thing down below, and I highly recommend checking it out. Now, you'd think a franchise with a sexy MC that is constantly framed in explicit shots would be a big hit with a straight male gamer crowd. But it seems that Bayonetta's strong, domineering, take-no-shit, in-control attitude is a big turnoff for many. My theory for this is that a common idea of the male gaze, or the male power fantasy, involves the men having power over the situation. With Bayo, though, she's always shown to be the one in control of the situation. The men of the game don't sexualize her, and never put her in these sexual positions. 
Hi, quick side note. So I know what I said just now, but I'd like to add a little asterisk to it, that there are some scenes in the first game, looking back, that can definitely be seen as Luca sexualizing her. Luca definitely has a romantic or physical attraction to Bayonetta, and there are some scenes where they're in compromising positions together, but you get the impression more that Bayonetta is the one that did this deliberately, is deliberately toying with him, things like that. She's not actually romantically interested or involved with him. And even this scene in the helicopter, where you could say that this is from his gaze, seems to be more a comedic moment that ends in him actually getting big full face of egg because he's distracting himself from the missiles that are flying right at his helicopter. So any scene in which someone tries to sexualize Bayonetta ends up horribly for them, and they end up just getting humiliated, thrown against a wall, or what have you in the process. So Bayonetta is still the one in control of things, and... If you don't have her permission, or if she has not initiated that, you are going to be in for a bad time. Alright, back to the video. She's depicted as the one in control of the situation, and that takes away the idea of the male power fantasy to have that control. That doesn't necessarily translate to her being a female power fantasy, mind you. As seen in this Reddit thread, there are certainly people who see Bayonetta as one, but for others, her overtly sexual nature is a turnoff for them. Neither party is wrong in that regard. As Bayonetta is a character, she's at the whim of her creators and the people who perceive her. Any agency she is shown to have is there because she's designed to have it. Huh. You're only granted as much agency as you're allowed. Well, isn't that a philosophical quandary? Kamiya-san himself has gone on record to say Bayonetta is his ideal woman. So we know there are men who are still attracted to Bayonetta's character and her domineering step on the energy. She's a character envisioned by a man but brought to life by a woman. She may initially seem to fit the male gaze, but given how a large part of that is diminishing women while bolstering men, it doesn't fit the way Bayonetta is portrayed. She's not even in the harder to find female gaze because, while she's constantly acting feminine, she's not shown to be acting for anyone other than herself. Even the hypersexualized camera angles and cutscenes don't feel to be through anyone's particular gaze. Bayo was never put in those positions through any male character. You get the impression it doesn't matter who is there, she'd act all the same. So her sexual nature comes off as more part of Bayonetta's design and character than anything else. I provided a link to a video on the male and female gaze below. It's fascinating stuff. Now establishing that Bayonetta, while sexualized, isn't strictly through anyone's gaze, her appeal may even lie in that fact. From what I've read, many identify with how Bayonetta is portrayed to own the screen, and for some, the overt sexual nature of her is part of that. For many as well, that's the part that turns them off of her character. I personally am on the side that sees Bayonetta as a strong character, but I'm certainly not going to play with family in the room any time ever. As I said before, Bayonetta is a character, and it is up to the player of how they interpret her. I do know I would like for all the things people see in her, her dominatrix-like persona, her campy nature, drag queen energy, and so on, to be intentional, and perhaps Bayonetta's mere existence has inspired more female characters to headline these games. One thing, however, is for sure. Bayonetta broke the mold and shook up the industry. Let me tell you about Hegemony of Play. Hegemony of Play was coined in 2005 and basically means that games had become stagnant in their development, team, and audience, and basically that they had all become dominated by men. Bayonetta no less than four years later shook that up. The game was at the height of technology at the time, and as a AAA title, meaning it goes along with the idea of industry graphical history. If you look at Kamiya-san's most famous prior game, Devil May Cry, the team is mostly, if not all, men. Bayonetta flips that by not only having more women on the team, but having them in vital roles. Not just in Mari, but in conceptual designer Ikumi Nakamura. Yep, that Ikumi Nakamura. It's spooky. <laughs> this further extends into Bayonetta 2, who had even more women on the crew, including producer Akiko Kuroda. Furthermore, Bayonetta as a character breaks hegemony merely by her headlining a big title. Among characters like Samus and Laura, who headlined tentpole titles in an age where it wasn't so common, Bayonetta shook up the action hack and slash genre by having a female protagonist, and one that kicks absolute ass, if I may add. That doesn't even mention Jean or Madama Butterfly, two other characters that are entitled to the plot and the game, even with the possibility to play as Jean after the first playthrough. They set out to make a strong female character for the game to differentiate the game from the slew of male-driven action titles, and in the end, that's exactly what they did. And finally, there's the audience. Like mentioned before, 
As much as it seems Bayonetta would have an audience largely comprised of straight male players, turns out she has quite a large fan base of women and queer players. Many even referring to Bayo as a gay icon for her campy aesthetic, drag queen persona, commanding confident attitude, and strong connection to her umbran sister, Jean. There's panels, articles, threads, forums, and others showing how much Bayo has resonated with this audience. Bayonetta breaks hegemony of play, and I can only imagine what episode 3 is going to do for that as well. <laughs> Bayonetta as a character has come a long way in the public eye since 2009. While the controversy may not have entirely gone away, Bayonetta's character continues to thrive as more and more people discover her, even becoming playable in Smash Bros a few years ago to the raucous applause of the entire internet. And furthermore, upon the recent release of the Bayonetta 3 trailer. It's hard to say that Bayonetta the game was set out with any of this in mind, but we do know that they wanted to make the best hack and slash game they could with an unforgettable main character. And along the way, they've made a character that has remained in the public eye for more than a decade now, and whose fan base is expanding every year. And hopefully from here it's just more and more diversity in the gaming field. I don't think I'd say that all female characters in games should be like Bayonetta, but that's also because all types of characters should exist. All types of backgrounds and personalities should exist. All types of main characters should exist in all types of games. Bayonetta came out of a time where the market was full of games with one type of protagonist. So having a strong, confident, overtly sassy, and powerful woman leading a tentpole title was a breath of fresh air. Yes, she is highly sexual, and often framed in the most gratuitous way imaginable. But, the games are not asking to be taken seriously. For an example that shows the importance of tone and seriousness with sexual portrayals, let's look at Metal Gear Solid V. In MGS5, you have the sniper Quiet. She wears a bikini and fishnets, and is too framed in sexual shots. There's a plot reason for this, and it's that... She breathes through her skin. She's photosynthetic. You know... Like the end from MGS3? What, no bikini for Grandpa over here? Quiet received much ire upon announcement, and Hideo Kojima promised we'd all be ashamed of ourselves for the ire once we knew why she wears that outfit. In the end... It came off as wanting to justify having a female character in a bikini for no reason. What makes Bayonetta different is transparency and tone. It's a franchise where a 500-year-old witch fights angels while rocking a pair of gun heels, an outfit made of her hair, and walks like a runway model. It knows what it wants to be and goes balls to the wall with it. The creators were completely clear that they wanted the game to be sexy and make Bayonetta sexy because it's what they wanted. And that's not for everyone. And it's easy to say that nothing is for everyone, but it's important to acknowledge where these things come from and the intentions behind them. Even if they didn't come from the best places, people can still find their own connections with them. At the end of the day, what an artist may intend to do is not what people will interpret their work as. And as it turns out, many have found their love and connections to Bayonetta and identify with the many different aspects of her. Games and characters like this may not have the broadest appeal, the games like this push the industry and spark conversation, especially when they are bigger titles made by big companies. And that's why Bayonetta has persisted to be the iconic character she is. Because love her or hate her, she's a positive sign in the industry, and no doubt inspired many characters and games in the years to come. Has all that been the best and most unproblematic representations? Eh, maybe not. But progress is full of trial and tribulation. And I believe that Bayonetta's existence is a positive one for the industry. She's made her name as one of the most celebrated characters in gaming, and her games rank among the best of their years and genre. And as the third game appears on the horizon, I can't wait to see what's in store for her, the franchise, and the gaming industry as a whole. The more voices being heard, the more stories being told, and the more types of characters we have, the better the industry can be overall. Let's dance!